Scientists at Northwestern University of Illinois published a study recently attempting to establish the relationship between brain damage and religion. They were trying to prove that people that really, really believed in things like God and old texts and healing, they were brain damaged. And so they defined what they meant. To them, religious fundamentalism refers to an ideology that emphasizes traditional religious texts and discourages progressive thinking about those things. Meaning, if you believe that the Bible is the Word of God and that it doesn't change over time, then you're one of these people that they're trying to focus on. And so they needed to understand that there are 2.3 billion Christians on the earth most of which believe in the Bible, in God, and that Jesus rose from the dead. These 2.3 billion people are the ones that they are saying might have brain damage. And so to test their theory, they used only Vietnam War veterans because many of these Vietnam War veterans had brain damage and many of them were Christians. And CT scans were taken of both the non-Christians and the Christians that had brain damage to find out that the majority of those tested with brain damage turned out to be Christians. Wait a minute. I'm only testing a Vietnam group of brain damaged people that are Christians. And the majority of them came out brain damaged Christians. Therefore... Their conclusion was is that fundamental belief in the scriptures, actual belief in Jesus raising from the dead, is associated with brain damage. And their conclusion was, I'm not kidding, they wrote this, in the future there will be a pill able to reverse the dangers of religion. <sighs> Let that sink in a bit. We give pills for hyperactive kids. We give, kids for, we give pills for defiant children. We give pills for children that sleep too much. And then we tell them, drugs don't work. Just say no to drugs. And soon, we're looking at children being medicated without the parent's permission in some cases. Will there be a pill one day that identifies children of religious families? It says, here's a preventative so that you won't start believing in these things. I'm not saying this to scare us. The world's always been scary since the beginning of time. What I'm saying is, is that there is a problem with the way some people address religion from the very beginning. From the first moment they're exposed to religion, they have to have what are called presuppositions. All truth that you believe starts with a presupposition. And here's the weird thing, whether it's science, medicine, philosophy, or religion, the presuppositions start how you look at all of them, and presuppositions cannot be proven. All presuppositions, even science, science starts on the presupposition that mathematics is the ultimate language. You can't prove that. There is no proof of that. We accept it as true. We observe that it seems to work, but there's no proof of it. Try to prove the number two. Where did number twos come from? Where do they get created? Well, I have one and I have one. That's two. Yes, that's one and one, but where does two come from? Is it a mystical thing? Is it a physical thing? No, it's just an idea. It can't be proven. All ideas, all science, all philosophy, all religion starts with a presupposition. And most people start with the presupposition, I'm all there is. You don't believe that? Try raising a toddler. We start with the idea, I'm all there is, my thoughts matter, my judgment's the most important. You know, one of the biggest problems in psychology, they even have a whole field of study of it, is when people believe that right now, this minute, they have all the information they need to make a perfect judgment about something. I have all the information I need to judge whether or not Jesus is real. I don't need to learn anything else. I've already decided. That's actually a mental illness, whether it's science or religion, to say it's settled. 
I can't learn anymore is a psychological problem. We start by saying, there might be a God, and we look. Or we start by saying, no, there might not be a God, and we look. And that changes how we look at every data piece. If you believe that God can do miracles, and somebody comes to you and says, hey, the Lord healed me of cancer, you might say, well, praise the Lord. But if you start from the presupposition, there is no God, and you say, or someone says to you, uh, the Lord healed me of cancer, you say, yeah, I'm going to hide this knife now. Because you've assumed an unprovable presupposition. There is or there isn't a God. What does this have to do with Palm Sunday? Jesus comes into Jerusalem riding a donkey. And some people, will, you'll read it and says, oh, that was to show his humility that he was riding a donkey, that he wasn't a conquering king. But history shows us that many conquering kings did ride into their capital cities on donkeys to show their humility, but to also show they're the only ones riding. <laughs> Everybody else is walking. He came in as a king. John chapter 12 tells this story, and I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to read quite a bit of this for the moment. The news that Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem swept through the city. A large crowd of Passover visitors took palm branches and went down the road to meet him. They shouted, praise God, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hail to the King of Israel. These people in large numbers are saying, this is our king. He has come to kick out the Romans, to reform the Jewish religion, to build up Jerusalem once again into a superpower. They were ready. Decades of being beaten down by the Roman invaders. Decades of being beaten down by the harshness of Pharisaical rulership in the church or in the religion. Many in the crowd had seen Jesus call Lazarus from the tomb, raising him from the dead, and they were telling others about it. This was the reason so many went out to meet him, because they had heard about the miraculous signs. Surely this is the Messiah. We've heard that he can raise someone from the dead. We have an eyewitness right here. Several of us have heard, or some of us have eaten, of the food that he produced out of just a few loaves and a couple of fishes. We've seen him heal the hand of a leper. We've seen him heal the whole body of a leper. We've seen a man who couldn't walk get up and carry his bed and go home. This must be the king. This must be the Messiah. This is why we have all these palm leaves. Welcome, King, welcome, Savior. What's he going to do? Well, he's going to kick out the Romans, and he's going to make sure that we have bread and fish on the table every day. And the health care system is going to be great. Free. And nobody dies. And if they do, he, he, just, he raises them up. This is going to be the greatest king we've ever had. And then what does Jesus do? Jesus replied, now the time has come for the Son of Man. Now, did you, did you ever get confused about that when Jesus says Son of Man instead of Son of God? Let me, let me clear this up for you. Jesus never referred to himself as the Son of God. That doesn't mean he's not. He always referred to himself as the Son of Man to emphasize the fact that God had become a man born of a woman and with us. He never denied being the Son of God. He didn't call himself the Son of God. He called himself God. In John chapter 14 later, he's going to say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. But he called himself the Son of Man to emphasize his humanity, his brotherhood with us. Now the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory. I tell you the truth. Unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. But its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. 
And the crowd who is waiting for the king to bring free health care and free food is saying, uh, what? Huh? Oh, is he telling us his new agriculture reform plans? Is that, is that what he's talking about? Then he says, those who love their life in this world will lose it. Those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. Anyone who wants to be my disciple must follow me because my servants must be where I am. And the Father will honor anyone who serves me. Oh, okay, Jesus, we got the follow you part. We're, we're here to, but what's this part about losing our lives? Well, now my soul is deeply troubled, he said. Should I pray, Father, save me from this hour? But this is the very reason I have come. Father, bring glory to your name. And then a voice spoke from heaven saying, I have already brought glory to my name and I will do so again. And the crowd falls silent. Who was that? And then Jesus says, And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. He said this to indicate how he was going to die. Uh, um, will this be after we crown you king? Will this be after you make sure everybody has bread and fish on the table? Will this be after you've made sure everybody is healed? Because especially, will this be after you kick out the Romans? Will this be after your four-term election or after your eight-term election? Because we didn't expect the Messiah of eternity to come and just give up. What do you mean? And see, this is the message of Palm Sunday. An entire city put down palms to receive the king that they wanted but they raised up a cross and crucified him when he told them i'm not giving you what you want i'm here to do something else and this is where we face right here on the very day that he comes into jerusalem he announces to them i am going to die for you it's not a metaphor I will be lifted up, I will die, and then everything will be set right. And this is where we come to the place where the writer C.S. Lewis said we have to make a conclusion about Jesus. Everybody in the world, it seems, is willing to acknowledge this Jesus in one way or another. And most of the world, it seems, is able to look at Jesus and say, Wow, what a good teacher the muslims they recognize that jesus was a historical figure and they say yes he was one of the very good teachers the buddhists recognize jesus and most of them say he was just a very 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 wise teacher and some of the buddhists say that jesus was one of the seven buddhas he was just one of them other religions look to jesus as a a simple example of how one man can become godlike and everybody can do that. But he's just a teacher. C.S. Lewis said that when we come to this point, when we come to the point where we welcome him in, but then he says things like this, we can no longer call him a teacher. And we can no longer call him a wise man. We have a choice, he said. He can either be the Lord he can be a liar or he can be a lunatic. Those are your only choices. Now suppose I come back from two weeks vacation and I stand up here and we get ready to start our service and I say to you folks, I, I just want you to know that while I was gone for two weeks, I learned something about myself. I realized that the world can be made right if you would all kill me, what would you do? There would probably, you know, 
probably, you know, Steve would probably stand up and say, the steering, you know, the, the pulpit search committee is reformed. We're going we're gonna to be looking for a new pastor. What if I came to you and said that all of the problems in your life, all of the desires of your heart can be fulfilled only when I'm killed by the government? How are you going to respond to that? You see, we don't think of people saying those kinds of things, do we? What if then I told you, but don't worry, because three days later, I'm going to rise again. Well, I'm pretty sure we would reduce our membership to a significant amount if I didn't leave. Because those aren't things that good teachers, wise teachers say. In a world where all of us think that my judgment is enough to find truth, the teacher who comes and says, well, my death will make the world right and then I'll raise again on three days, we kind of put up the barriers and say, whoa, partner, you need to slow down on that. I kind of like your deal of feeding everybody and I like your deal of healing everybody. I'm pretty fond of the taking care of people. I'm not too excited about the forgiving my enemy part, but I can get that, you know. This part about you're going to die for me and then raise from the dead, I... See, because I don't have any control over that. That's not something I do. I want you to teach me things that I do to get closer to God. I don't want you to tell me this crazy stuff. And so here's our choices. When we put down our palm leaves and we welcome Jesus in, what are we welcoming him in for? What are we asking him to come in for? Are we asking him to make bread and fish? Give me plenty. Oh, Lord, give me this. And, oh, Lord, give me that. And I want a pony and a fire truck. And we treat him like this cosmic Santa Claus. Or do we say, Lord, I've got this ailment and I've got this hurt and my body aches. And I'm calling you in for the healing because you heal. And, oh, we'll put down the palm leaves for that. Do you need some Romans kicked out of your life? Lord, I got a, I got a gang that lives across the street. I, I've got violence in my neighborhood. Uh, Lord, uh, I feel persecuted at work. The boss hates me. Uh, at school, I'm being bullied. Lord, come and kick out the Romans. But when the Lord comes in because we've put down the palm leaves and asked him to come in, and we start going to church and saying, I'm a Christian, and then he says, Michael, what I really need you to do is to take up your cross to die to your desires, to die to your addictions, to die to your money, to die to the things you love so that you can start loving the things God loves. Whoa, now, hey, dying is not what I came to church for. I came for the abundant life. People told me my life would be better. And now you're telling me i got to die. Well, Michael, you know, those who love their life are going to lose it. And those who lose their life for me are, are going to find it. Yeah, God, that just sounds like a chicken and an egg argument. I don't get that. I'm not following you. And so we come to this Jesus, who is supposed to be a good teacher, and we say, well, you know what? Maybe he was a liar. Maybe he was this guy who just wanted his 15 minutes of fame, and he came up with all these great things to say until people figured out he was lying. Because people don't rise from the dead, and people don't get healed, and you can't make... Hundreds and hundreds of loaves and dozens of fish out of just seven and two. Maybe it was all a lie. Here's your problem, though. You can't say Jesus was a good teacher if you thought he was a liar. You can't say, well, we're the church, but we don't believe Jesus is the center of the church because all of that stuff about miracles, that's just a lie. I don't follow liars. Anybody here follow liars? I voted for some, but, you know, later I, I figured it out. Do we follow liars? No. So Jesus can't be the good teacher if everything he said was a lie. So we have the other possibility that's brought up. Well, he was just crazy. 
All of that stuff he says about loving your neighbor, that's good. But when it came to the dying for us and raising from the dead, well, that was just because he let the power go to his head. You know how rich people, famous people get. You know, the, the teenage girl on the Disney Channel gets famous, and pretty soon she's doing things that even Playboy says. <laughs> and, you know, just power goes to their head. And so Jesus was great until he got to Jerusalem, and they invited him in, and then he started talking about all this, you know, dying to save us stuff. That was just power trip. Well, you know what? I don't follow people that are crazy. Sandy married one, but, you know, that's not the same thing. You don't follow crazy people because they lead you astray. Well, Michael, how do we know Jesus wasn't lying or he wasn't a lunatic? Well, okay, I can accept that somebody says he was lying or that he was a lunatic as long as they don't say he was a good teacher because he can't be a good teacher if those two are true. But here's why I know that those two are not true. Thomas, who doubted the resurrection until he saw Jesus and touched him, went to India to spread the gospel by himself. And on a hill in southern India, in the city of Madras, the Raj, the king, said, if you don't deny that Jesus is the Son of God, I will cut off your head right here. And Thomas said, I can't deny. Cut off my head. Jesus is the Son of God. And they cut off his head in India. He was alone. All he had to do was say, no, 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 Jesus is a good teacher. Gone back to Jerusalem and said, guys, I knocked him dead in India. But he couldn't. Because it wasn't a lie and it wasn't lunacy. Peter, crucified. John, in prison in hard labor, died in prison. Boiled in oil at one point, and he didn't die, so they put him in prison again. All of the disciples died in torture. One was quartered, meaning they tied his arms and legs to horses and pulled him in different directions. And they said, just say that Jesus is not the Son of God and we'll let you go. And they were off in other countries with no witnesses from Jerusalem. And he, they said, no, I can't deny Jesus Christ. Any of you feel like you would die for a lie if you were going around saying, yeah, yeah, our pastor said that he would die and raise from the dead, but then he did, would you die for that if it was just a lie and you knew it was a lie? If you thought Michael was crazy, you might follow me for a while when things are working, but when things get tough, Michael's crazy, I'm out of here. These 12 did not shirk at death in the face of denying Christ. Because they'd made that decision. He's not a lunatic. He's not a liar. The only other choice I have is that he's exactly who he says he is. And that is Lord. So they put down their palm leaves. They said, come into my heart, live in my life, and take your seat as the king. See, most of us live a life where we, our, our, our kingdom, our life, we are on the throne. I sit on the throne of my life. I rule my life. And Jesus is an advisor. Jesus walks in and says, you're in my seat. And we must get out of that seat, humble ourselves, and let him sit in that seat. And we say, what am I doing today, Lord? What is your will, Master? Michael, I want you to stop spending so much money on toys. I don't buy toys, Lord. Let's see. How many 3D printers do you have? How many computers do you have? How much was that big old Ford F-150 with all the bells and whistles? I don't buy toys, uh, Lord. They're tools. Okay, Michael, I want you to buy, stop buying so many tools. Now you're meddling, preacher. And Jesus says, I'm not the preacher, I'm the Lord. Have I come to that place where Jesus is always on the throne in my life? No. I'm often wrestling him for... 
you know, you're in my favorite recliner, Lord. Yeah. And you've got the remote. Yeah. Sometimes I want the remote. Sometimes I want the recliner. And Jesus is Lord and he gets to sit there. If I've put down the palm leaves to invite him in, I cannot turn around and walk away when he says, I'm in charge. When you invite the king into the city, who is he? He's the king. Who gets to dictate the rules? The king. Oh, but we're in a democracy. We Americans, we understand democracy now. Well, that's nice. I haven't found a translation yet that says that Jesus wants to be your president for two terms. He's the king. And if we're going to put down those palm leaves, we are going to listen to what he says. Long live the king. Put your trust in the light while there is still time. Then you will become children of of the light. Jesus is not here to teach us a good way to live. And I'm going to go out on a limb here, folks. Jesus didn't come here to teach us morality. The Old Testament teaches morality, and get what you know what the message of the Old Testament is? None of us can live up to it. None of us can be perfect. Jesus didn't come to tell us who to vote for, how to live our country life, how to how to be good, he taught us to surrender to him and let him rule us. Because I've been running my own life and it's not been doing all that great. So I'm going to let him run it. The palm trees, the palm leaves come down to let the Lord walk into my life and be the Lord. Otherwise, A week later, we're in the crowd screaming, crucify him. Because he didn't give us what we asked for. And the church is dying in this country because of a bunch of Christians screaming that the Lord hasn't given them what they ask for. But never once have they asked him, what should we do? Or when he said, is there another answer, Lord? Is there something else we could do? Put down those palm leaves. Put them right in front of you and say, walk on in and take control. Here is your seat. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that we are people of the palm leaves, inviting you in. Not just into our lives to teach us or advise us. Not just to give us some truths, but to be the truth of our lives. To be the Lord of our lives. To guide us and teach us and to end our suffering. But we take on your suffering. We take on your labors. We join you in the work of restoring the world to the kingdom. Help us fight for what matters. Help us suffer for things that will make a difference in eternity. And to give up the pains and suffering of this world that have only come through our desires. Help me, Lord, to nail my desires to the cross and be free. We ask this in your holy name. Amen. Won't you stand with me for our invitation?